Welcome to Bible Believers Fellowship. On this program, we are studying 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18, where we are commanded, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Obedience brings blessings, but disobedience carries serious consequences. We invite you to join us in our study of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 11 through 18, titled, Be ye not unequally yoked. And it's, as the message title appears there, Be Ye Not Unequally Yoked. But before we get into that um, meat of the message, he starts out in 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And if you're there, uh, I'm going to have you read silently with me, because I'm going to break this down a little bit as we go through this. Beginning of verse 11, he says, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children, be ye also enlarged. Now right away, most people reading that, uh, I remember the first time I re read this, I, I, is he saying bowls? It's spelled like bowels. What, what's he saying here? And it, it sounds a little strange, but... Yes, he's saying, ye are straightened in your own bowels. And uh, that is what we call an English idiom. Not an idiot, an English idiom. <laughs> and uh, there are really three there, three phrases in that, those two verses. Our heart is enlarged, straightened in your bowels, be ye also enlarged. Now at first glance it almost sounds like you just got bad news from your doctor. Yeah. An enlarged heart, your bowels should not be straightened, <laughs> physically speaking, and uh, it sounds like you're swollen. Be ye also enlarged. Just think of it this way, we like to make fun of how other cultures speak, and this of course is the past culture, Elizabethan, Elizabethan and uh, Victorian culture. But before we make fun of other people, we better be ready to laugh at ourselves. Amen. And you think about uh, some of the things we say, and idioms we use. Uh, I made a little list here of a, a few, but how many of you said, boy, he's barking up the wrong tree? Now, someone who doesn't speak English is going to say, he's actually barking? <laughs> Why is he barking up a tree? <laughs> now, as Americans, we've heard this kind of language, or that kind of idiom our whole lives, and we don't think anything of it. But look at it literally. Like, we were just looking at that last, those last two verses that we read. Someone's barking up the wrong tree? That doesn't sound like he's, you know, all there, huh? <laughs> How many of you fall in love? Fall in love. Hope you wasn't hurt. Now someone in another culture would see fall in love. They don't talk like that. Uh, another one is, I could eat a horse. Goodness, keep him away from my farm. <laughs> How many of you, his bark is worse than his bite? He bites? <laughs> yeah. Uh, one more is, uh, that cost me an arm and a leg. Oh, you look like you still have your arms and legs. So that's just the same thing. As you read the Bible, you see these idioms. Don't be too quick, number one, to make fun, although there's nothing wrong with getting a good laugh out of it. But I mean, just understand, you as an American, you use plenty of those same idioms. And uh, some people also say, well, wouldn't you argue that at least it should be updated to... But then the question is, well, whose idioms are you going to use? You go down to New Orleans where my sister lives and they, they say things and I have no idea what they're saying. And then you say some things and you find out it means something totally different down there. And what was it, just in the last couple of weeks my sister actually posted something on Facebook where she had been saying something and had no idea. What was it? Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Or forget about it. Forget about it. Or, yeah, when you just say, oh, forget about it. Well, I don't know about you, but to me that just means I'm telling you not to waste time and effort on it. But down there, it's basically like telling them to go to H-E-L-L. And they take it offensively. If you say, well, 
Yeah, it turns out all for 11 years she's been telling people that. <laughs> so, you know, then you talk about updating the Bible, you have to ask, well, what idioms are you going to use? Because even in America, not all English-speaking people use the same idioms. So that's why I don't think we should tamper with the Word of God. We just should educate yourself. Learn. <laughs> Grow. Learn something new. It won't hurt you. Now, there's basically what um, you're looking at when you see in the Bible a reference to the bowels. The deepest seat of emotions. Now, I'm going to give you a couple of uh, examples of how you can think of this and why this is such a good idiom to use. Now, it may sound a little strange to your ears as a 21st century American, but referencing to the bowels in this way is uh, when you're wanting to talk about the deepest emotion and feeling of your being. Think of this. Have you ever, and I have, have you ever seen a mother holding her dying child in her arms? I have. And on, t on two different occasions. And the, the emotion goes right down into her gut to, sh to where she could not, in both cases, could not stand, hit the ground, clutching herself. You see, in these uh, writings that you see the reference to the bowels, those King James translators understood what the Bible was saying was this deep emotional feeling that is unexplainable except to just reference the deepest part of your gut. And that's the word we would use a lot of times, our gut. Amen. I know on more than one occasion in my life I have suffered some huge loss and it felt like someone kicked me in the gut. So from now on when you read about the bowels in your King James Bible, you understand that's the kind of thing it's talking about. Here's something else that I have not experienced, but I know a man who actually did this during the Vietnam War. He had to go to a home and tell a young lady that her husband was not coming home. And he said, you know, with no exception, there was this immediate grasping of the gut. Bowels. Deepest emotion of your being. And I couldn't help but think of this. <laughs> Have you seen the response when a Muslim finds out that someone's drawn a cartoon of Muhammad? <laughs> That's the kind of thing you get. <laughs> So uh, that's the kind of English idiom you're dealing with, the bowels, that gut response. Um, it also says our heart is enlarged. How many of you, this is just one way of putting it, you can put this in many other ways. How many of you uh, heard the saying, uh, we're an open book? And then uh, the last one there, straightened in your bowels, I said anguished in your deepest being. Straightened is... Uh, you think about uh, being straightened, you've basically been flattened out. Something has so emotionally rocked you that you have been straightened out, um, just smashed, leveled. You know, we say things like, uh, did you get the license plate of that truck that ran over you? You know, that's why we say that kind of thing. And then he says, be also enlarged. He's saying, open up your heart and see. How many times have we actually prayed that? So with that in mind, then he says, now, after appealing to you to open up your heart and to see that he is just being an open book to them, he's asking them to consider this unequal yoke with unbelievers that is going on in the church of Corinth. In Corinth, it was a very worldly church and there was mixed relationships that should not be. And he says, adamantly, read that with me, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness, and what communion hath light with darkness, and what concord hath Christ with Belial, 
or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? He's asking some very good questions in contrast. In order to demonstrate the necessity for us to avoid that unequal yoke. Look at the context of his statement, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. The context is of fellowship, of righteousness, of communion, of light, of concord, believeth. It's all about a spiritual connection that he's talking about. Now these connections can be made in the physical realm, but don't fool yourself. They carry a spiritual reality with them. Now, look at the contrast he gave us. Um, righteousness with unrighteousness. Light with darkness. Christ with Belial. He that believeth with an infidel. And when it comes to righteousness with unrighteousness, the fact of the matter is, is most of the time, unrighteousness wins the day. You take ladies who have married unsaved men, men who have married unsaved women, very seldom does that work out to a happy ending. But you're in disobedience to the commandment and risking lifelong unhappiness when you ignore that. Uh, one of the most horrendous rebellions against this commandment is among churches. And it's been detrimental. For uh, the entire lifetime of Billy Graham's ministry, for example, he used as an excuse the fact that he was preaching the gospel to bring together in an unequal yoke churches that didn't even believe the Bible and the Roman Catholic churches, and even Jewish synagogues, which is something that I don't get. I don't understand that at all. And then when people would come forward at a Billy Graham crusade, they would simply ask them if they had a preference. And if they did, they sent that person back to that church or synagogue. So here you have people who come forward at the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ being sent back into a synagogue or a Catholic church or some other cult or liberal church that don't even believe the gospel. And the result, if you wonder why you see Christianity so dead today, there you go. And churches that don't even believe the gospel pulling in new believers and destroying their faith. And we're going to bear the consequences in this country. We're going to bear the consequences of ignoring God's commandment to be ye not unequally yoked. And in the marriage situation, because 99 out of 100 marriages that are unequally yoked end up disastrous, then we have children who are now adults who were raised in these broken families and broken homes without God and then you put them in public schools to boot where they're taught they're nothing but evolved animals. And now we're reaping that today. And I, I received, a, I was telling the girls this morning, I received a little video clip of what's called popular music today with, is it Bri Rihanna and Britney and Lady Gaga and uh, I can't remember all the names of the groups and absolute whores. Absolute whores. Having sex with their clothes on. And on stage and in their videos. And that's what our children are watching. And raising a child like that, you are producing an unequal yoke on that child. If you are raising your child in a Christian home, quote unquote, and taking them to church, but then they are spending their day listening to that garbage, you're going to lose your child. Amen. You will lose them. Because unrighteousness in, in rebellion and disobedience, unrighteousness will win. 
God wins with obedience. But when we rebel against God, God says, my hands are off. It's clear from this that believers are commanded to refrain from yoking with unbelievers. Well, what's the yoke? That's a question a lot of people ask. What's the yoke? Um, that's a yoke. <laughs> so when you think of uh, the yoke, it's a tie that binds. And a lot of people try to make excuses to go ahead and yoke up with unbelievers by saying, well, this only speaks of marriage. The context isn't marriage. The context is any uh, yoke with unbelievers that puts you in a situation where you are tied to that person. It can be a marriage. And if you marry somebody as a Christian and they're not a Christian, 99% of the time you are going to regret it for the rest of your life. And it could cost you your children. And so if you marry an unbeliever, you are in rebellion against God. And let me tell you, uh, many of the young people here, if you want Pastor Greg to do the wedding, but if there is an unequal yoke, I will not be party to that. Amen. Marriage really is uh, any bringing together of a man and woman sexually. Kids. If you think you're going to have sex with about 12 or 13 different people and then get married, in the eyes of God, you've been making a mockery of marriage. You've been married 12 or 13 times. Go back to 1 Corinthians 7. When you sexually join to somebody, God says you've become one flesh. Now God forgives that, but it doesn't mean He removes the consequences. So any sexually transmitted diseases you pick up, any pregnancies that come along, you're stuck with those consequences for life. And we promote marriage in the sense of coming before a pastor, not because it's in the Bible, because it's not. You won't find that in the Bible. We promote that because Romans 13 says that we are to abide by the law of the land, and the law of the land says that if you want the benefits of marriage, you need to either go before a judge or a licensed minister. Myself, Mike Kaler, will be happy to do the honors for you if you'd like, and we will sign on the dotted line, say yes in front of witnesses. They declared their commitment to each other in marriage. But if you're not equally yoked, don't come to me. <laughs> Go to a judge. Because I won't have anything to do with it. Business contracts. You don't believe me, write uh, any number of preachers that, uh, in the area or on the radio and they will tell you how many men and women have come and said how they regret joining in a business contract with an unbeliever. Why? Well, because if you're a spirit-filled Christian and you're, ma you're a, a married to another man in a business contract or another woman and they want to break the law, they want to cheat the taxes, they want to keep double books or whatever along those lines and you don't. And then you find out they did it behind your back because they knew as a Christian you wouldn't go along with it. All kinds of things that can happen in business contracts. Church affiliation that are not pastored by believers, not filled with believers. But they go because it's a beautiful building and they love the way this music sounds in the cathedral and their family grew up in that church. Or whatever the reason is, they are in rebellion against God, being unequally yoked in that church affiliation. You are encouraged to give your tithes and offerings. But you are going to be held responsible as to whether you gave that money to a Christian organization. I don't mean by name. I mean they really are Christians. Amen. They preach the gospel. They take a stand on the Word of God. If you're giving your money, for example, to a group called World Vision, you ought to stop. Because they do not preach the gospel and they are anti-Israel bringing a curse of God on that organization and they're trying to influence this country to do so and yet Christians go to these Christian concerts and all you see is world vision, world vision, world vision. What do you do? You have to do your research. Do your own homework. Find out about these organizations. Where do they stand? Be ye not unequally yoked. And then he asks some, some more questions. Uh, common sense questions, and what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? He's going to throw some people for a loop here because he says, for ye are the temple of the living God. So what's he saying there? 
What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? He's saying, what are you doing with false religion? What are you doing yoked up with unbelievers? You are the temple of God. What agreement hath the temple of God with idols? You are the temple of God. What agreement do you have with false religion and unbelievers? And you're going to bring a disaster to your life if you don't obey this commandment. Interesting, he says, as God had said, I will dwell in them. Do you think of yourself as that way through your day? When you're doing things that you shouldn't be doing, saying things you shouldn't be saying, do you want to disrespect God and bring question to that testimony by yoking up with an unbeliever? And he says, uh, and he walk in them. That doesn't mean God's in there walking around on your insides. That means that when you walk, when you're out walking the walk, God is walking in you. When you're doing the things you ought to do. But I got news for you. When you start doing the things you're not supposed to do, and you start yoking up with unbelievers, it's no more God walking in you. Now, it's not, again, let's keep this on even kill. It's not saying you lose your salvation, it's saying that you're destroying your relationship with God. He says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. He says exactly what to do in 2 Corinthians 6, 17. Read that with me. Wherefore, come out from among them and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. That is a conditional promise at the end of that verse and I will receive you, is conditioned on you obeying the first part of that verse. And that is to come out from among unbelievers and be separate. Touch not the unclean thing. You're no exception. That's what I guess Christians need to come to the realization there's no exceptions to these rules and these commandments. He's not speaking to everybody else but you in the room. <laughs> this is for all of us. And he says, if you'll come out from among them, if you'll touch not the unclean thing, I will receive you. That's a promise. And he's referencing here uh, Isaiah 52.11. Isaiah 52.11 says, Depart ye, depart ye, go you out from thence. Touch no unclean thing. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. Also, it's similar to what we read in the book of Revelation. In Revelation 18.4, it says, And I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. You see, that's, that's a reference to the whore in Rome. Amen. Revelation 17 declares that the whore is a religious system and that's Roman Catholicism under the Vatican. And that whore has been around for about 1,600 years as a counterfeit form of Christianity. And for 2,000 years, Christians, true Bible-believing Christians, have understood to come out from among her, but not in this day and age. This day and age, you can't hardly go to a contemporary Christian concert with a, or, or a comedian, go hear a comedian where they don't stand up there and, and say that we're all the same. We're all going to heaven whether you're a Catholic or a Baptist or a Pentecost or whatever. And I just want to stand up and say, no! You can be a Catholic and go to hell. You can be a Baptist and go to hell. <laughs> you can be a Pentecostal and, and go to hell. Why? Because it doesn't matter what church you go to or what you affiliate with, you must be born again. You're saved by believing the gospel. And further, there are some of those churches like the Roman Catholic Church, that preach a false gospel. So even more so, if you believe what your church is preaching and you're a, in a Catholic church or in one of these liberal churches or in a cult, then it's doubly important for you to understand. You must be born again. But every Christian you know who is using a new Bible translation, they have already surrendered to the Pope on that level because they are using the Pope's Bible. 
and every Christian using a new version should write a letter to the Pope and thank him for their Bible because they're using his Bible. They are in violation of this, not coming out and being separate. And that's why people you see using the new versions, I see it one after other, dropping like flies into apostasy. It is not an accident. Jesus said, these words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. And he said, you are to live by every word of God which proceedeth out of the mouth of God. And when you start messing with that book, you lose that spirit behind it. And if you continue with that new version, it will make shipwreck of your faith. I, and more and more Christians I know today are embracing the idea that the homosexual movement is fine. And they're doing it with an NIV in their hand. And one thing after another, like dominoes, it's all fallen. And it's because they're rejecting God's admonition. And this is why you see these churches and these people following on their face. It's because God has conditioned that if you will not follow this commandment, then you lose the promise. But if you will follow this commandment, be not unequally yoked. Come out from among them. Come out from among her. Verse 18, read that with me. And will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. You want God to be your father. You say, well, I'm saved. He's my father. Yes, but He can't always be, in a practical sense, your father when you're in rebellion against Him. And the same thing, it's just like what works with us and our children. I love my daughters, but we've talked. You may think I'm strange for having these kind of conversations with my daughters, but I do. And I've told them, you go walking out the door and serving the, the devil, you are not going to experience my being your father on a personal level. Because I will not endorse that lifestyle. I, here's just, here's the news flash. Any of my girls ever go into sin like that, they can come and visit me anytime they want because I will enjoy the opportunity to confront them in their sin. Amen. Every time they walk through the door. Right. And I'm not going to listen to this baloney blaming other people for the fact you won't go around them because they confront you with your sin. There's people out there say, well, they chased me away. Every time we're around, they wanted to talk about my... Praise the Lord. That's the way it ought to be. And don't blame them. When you stand before God, that lame excuse will not hold up. Amen. They loved you enough to tell you the truth, and you're the one who broke the relationship in rebellion. You're the one who rejected them, not the other way around. Now, I hope and pray I never have to have that situation with my daughters, and I hope none of the other children here have to have that situation. But you know what? I think children should know that's how it's going to go. Let me tell you something. I knew it. I lived in sin for about three years before I became a Christian, and... I was rarely ever around my family, my parents and my grandma Miller, because every time I went, I was confronted. Lovingly, but I was confronted. And you know what? I have other friends who were in rebellion against God, and their family condoned and accommodated them. They're still unsaved. My family was willing to hurt for three or four years, and they were willing to hurt for 60 years, I think, if it would take it that long. They were willing to hurt and not have a good, happy relationship with me because they were more concerned with my soul. Today, I'm saved. Be sure to visit our website at kjvbiblebelievers.com where you can find a wealth of MP3 audio message downloads along with additional videos, articles, and links. This message is brought to you by Bible Believers Fellowship, P.O. Box 662, Worthington, Ohio, 43085. I am Greg Miller. Thank you for listening.